Hello, my name's Alice Great and welcome to another episode of Inside the Petri Dish, the podcast that dissects science and takes a look down the microscope at controversial topics within research. In this episode of Inside the Petri Dish, we're going to be continuing our journey looking at climate change. I've been set the task to find out about climate change by Tay and Vicky. And in this episode, we take a look at how we can help limit the effects we have on the planet, which can be a bit of a moral struggle between the pennies in our pocket, what is available to us and what we already own. So I'm joined by Chrissy Middleton. She's a conservationist and a wildlife champion. Thank you so much for joining me. That's okay. Thank you for having me. So first things first, tell us a little bit about your work. Well, I'm currently a full-time student, um, so my work is very, very varied. I'm quite big on plastic pollution um, and climate change. Originally, that wasn't really my focus, to be honest. I was quite interested in human-wildlife conflict and looking at reintroducing endangered species but I just can't seem to get past the gravity of plastic pollution and climate change there's such huge issues in today's society and they're just they're issues that I feel we need to tackle so I almost just find myself gravitating towards those issues it's kind of an issue that a lot of people I don't think appreciate which isn't a condescending you know point to make you know if it's not someone's area of expertise and they're not going to understand all of it but conservationists spend a lot of their time dealing with policy, dealing with environmental conservation, dealing with sort of habitat restoration, because in terms of um, conserving a species long term, you need to tackle those issues first. And for example, ocean acidification, you can't hope to deal with the issues with corals until you've mitigated against those effects of ocean acidification so yeah they really do go hand in hand and um when I was doing A-levels I was all about wildlife and I really wanted to work with animals but as you go through education you kind of realise that I you know, realise that it's um possibly not going to be the case probably probably going to have to deal with more policy related issues and um almost changing public attitudes and things like that um but they are really the fundamental issues in in conservation. So Why is conservation so important when it comes to climate change? Climate change is one of the biggest drivers behind species decline at the moment. So, you know, you'll read sort of newspaper articles or you'll hear on the news that, um, let's say, so for example, well, we all know about the polar bears, but they might talk about the monarch butterfly and say that there's an issue with habitat destruction or habitat alteration that's endangering monarch butterflies. But the the cause the causing factor behind that is climate change and there might be issues about yes coral bleaching and the rising temperatures but that's that's climate change there's animals being sort of dispersed being moved away from where they originally live um animals who would normally migrate to habitats and those habitats aren't fit for them anymore and it all comes back to climate change and um conservationists cannot hope to resolve those issues and, and um conserve those species until we tackle you know, we need to develop a mechanistic understanding to, you know, deal with the physical processes at the very bottom. And before you can really hope to, to, you know, if you look at it like a trophic cascade almost, you can't really hope to deal with the bigger issues until you've looked at the, the smaller issues, the fundamental underlying issues, really. So what stood out from what you just said for me was the idea of animals moving um, away from their original habitat and um that sounds in itself like a simple thing you know we move around all the time but for a species to move around that can have impacts on that new habitat for so if you're talking about a predatory animal and that takes on a new habitat that can have huge consequences or or even small things like when you're talking about the monarch butterfly and the decline of that um some people will be like, oh, what's the big deal? It's, it's just a bug. Well, all of these tiny puzzle pieces play a huge, a huge role in keeping a balanced ecosystem. It all plays a part. And so there can be downstream consequences for even bacteria or um, insects not being able to survive in those environments. And it's it's... And again, to pick up on another point you said, it's only by talking to people and changing policy that you can really get that across. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You um, <clears throat> you seem to know more than I do. Um, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's quite difficult 
to so if we just at the moment focus on sort of getting people to understand it's really difficult to press those points on people um, because like you say they're not really interested in the the creepy crawlies and and things like that and um I know a number of my friends who'd be bored to tears if I sat down and tried to explain the intricacies of ecological processes within an ecosystem so they get a little bit fed up but um so like you said when animals are dispersed so invasive species not just due to climate change are another huge um, issue for endangered species they're another big driver so um you know like when way back when um rats were transported to australia or something like that because they jumped on a boat and then all of a sudden they colonized in australia invasives are really really um impacting the habitats that they're now found in and obviously like you say that can happen with climate change the ecological interactions within the ecosystem can be really vulnerable and it doesn't take much in order for um for those to be affected so like you said if an animal is displaced and is found in another habitat um normally what you'll see is that they will outcompete generally they'll outcompete um other species and it can really impact other the abundances of other species and then the abundances of plant species and then you can have huge ecosystem shifts and it could, the ramifications can be really big and we can't forget either the ramifications on humans like you said we move everywhere and we are everywhere and so not only are we impacting on wildlife but if wildlife is displaced and is found in a new spot they can have real implications on humans um, even in developing countries there's a lot of people who depend on the land and if that land is not sufficiently giving them the services that they need then even humans can be impacted and that's actually a really good way to get people worried about these issues or concerned about these issues is to try and tie it back to how it will affect them it's it's funny how you always have to put the human interest in it to, to get people to talk about it. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm always quite reserved when talking about polar bears because whenever we talk about conservation and climate change, everyone seems to talk about polar bears. It's not just these big fluffy animals that um, are being affected by climate change and can have a real... Um, a, and their loss would be devastating. But to bring up polar bears... <laughs> Because the ice caps are melting and, and their environment is changing, they're moving, they're moving. So they're coming closer into human territories, which is obviously really dangerous. So I think that's another example of where um, climate change knocks on to animal lives and how that can influence humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I follow you on Instagram and I have done for a while. And... Um, I know that you're working on living um, a more environmentally friendly life and a so-called uh, zero waste journey. Can you tell us about what you're doing? So I do. I I study conservation and environmental science, and um, and at the beginning of this year, so even within the last sort of nine to ten months, I wasn't aware of zero waste living, and so you can just see how diff difficult it is to get other people on board with these things and why people are still using plastic straws and plastic bottles because I'll, I'll I'll see pictures of these on on Instagram and it blows my mind that anyone could possibly go and use a plastic straw but um admittedly it was only this year that I really sort of found zero waste living um but then when I sort of when you start doing it you realize just how easy it is so my fiance and I decided to start with our grocery shopping because that's really where you produce a lot of plastic. And I basically just did my research, um, found some bulk food stores nearby. We go to the um, green grocers um, and it's, it's so, so simple to, it can be a little bit difficult. Um, we've both got busy lives. So if you run out of food and it's sort of six o'clock in the evening, you can't pop down to the, to the dry food store and buy some oats. So it can be a little bit challenging, but um, you just have to sort of let go of some of those luxuries that you think you need that you don't really need. I was a huge obsessive of Nutella. Like I love Nutella and I'm pretty sure everyone else loves Nutella, but I had to give it up because of the palm oil. And um, I don't really miss it, to be perfectly honest. And I think it's just getting people to realise that they can sort of let go of some of these so-called sort of necessities. Um, but even things like, and we all bang on about it, even things like refusing plastic straws and um, you've heard it all before, but not using plastic bags um, 
and I think there's plastic as well in our lives that we don't even realize we use so the other day I was putting my hair clips in my hair and I was like oh my god this is made of plastic and I thought so um I, we still have a lot of plastic in the house because you know I mean who doesn't have bags and bags of blooming shower gel from years and years of Christmas presents so the only thing more wasteful than um producing plastic waste unnecessarily is to throw that stuff away before it's even been used so we're still using you know the stocks that we have and there's not like I said the only thing more wasteful would be for me to just throw that away and not even use it so um it's you have to take it in small increments if you hope to for this to be sustainable for me to continue this through our lives we have to do this slowly so we do still produce waste but um yeah we're just taking it step by step really to see how far we can go when we have kids that will be the issue <laughs> it's it's really difficult because our, our lives are so set up to be biased in that way towards plastic so the other day I was brushing my teeth and I and I just remember watching a program about like so like a, it was like a challenge where people were abandoned on an island and they had to see where what they could survive mm. on and they were scavenging around and someone found a toothbrush wow. you know and I just thought oh my god my toothbrush is plastic yeah, and then and I've just kept noticing more and more things or like um going into my kitchen and using a, a utensil and, and thinking god this is wrapped in plastic just trying to be aware when you're buying those purchases of being like okay I want this now but what are the implications of it in the future maybe five years down the line or even after I'm gone when my children or my family are having to clean up my house how much stuff is going to be left behind for millions of years yeah exactly yeah yeah I know it's so it when you uh, I get to the point now where everywhere I go all I see is waste um, even when I look at a house I look at that house and what's it made of and it sounds so ridiculous and um, I'm just one of those people but I just like you said that's the sort of thing I think of I look around my house and people are like yeah I know but this is reusable and this is reusable I'm like yes but one day and I hate to say the words you will not be here and your stuff is just going to be left and what, what do you suppose happens to it um and it's I think trying to get people I think basically and this is never going to happen but we need to stop using the words throw away there is no away things don't go away they're just they just move and they just go somewhere else and they're left somewhere else um and there's so many alternatives and I think what we really need to do is we need to get the big players like Waitrose and Tesco's and the supermarkets to be stocking the alternatives but that doesn't mean some sort of insane revolution to get plastic out of supermarkets all it would need all it would mean is to the, get them to start stocking um bamboo toilet brushes things like that you know you know your toilet brush is made of plastic your hairbrush is made of plastic there are so many wooden and bamboo alternatives and we just need to be getting them stocked in in these supermarkets and and placed in in prime position really so that people will actually find it easy it's, it's convenience isn't it people don't want to go to this little gift shop down the road and buy themselves a bamboo hairbrush because they can just pop to Morrison's and stick it in their trolley and I appreciate that I don't always have the time to do that um so yes there is plastic everywhere <laughs> so looking around my my house or anything like that and I see all the plastic that's going to be left behind or the items that are going to be left behind when I die and they're going to be around for in some cases, millions of years. And there are many things I'd like to do for the planet that leave my mark on the planet for millions of years, but I don't want that to be like plastic. Yeah. I want it to be something else. And so when we're talking about getting more of these uh, alternatives into the supermarket, something I think would be really important is to make sure they were affordable because there's a huge economic d gap at the moment because environmentally friendly things can often be priced as luxury and that leaves people on a lower income out of being able to invest in that as much as they'd like to yeah it was a big deal for me um the toothbrush the bamboo toothbrush one is quite difficult because they are quite pricey um <clears throat> for a toothbrush so that was one i was thinking i was talking to one of the lecturers at university the other day about this trying to think how how we could get these into the shops but 
like you say, even once they're in the shops, well, they probably wouldn't get into the shops because the supermarket would tell us that they're just not feasible because they're just they're, they cost too much um and some of my family members who <laughs> I think I've just ridden them with guilt for the last three years <clears throat> um my mum bless her who's sort of trying to take it all on board and she wants a bamboo toothbrush um but they do cost they do cost a lot of money and you know the if the companies from Australia a lot of them in Australia or the USA and then you've got postage and packaging toothbrushes are you you're advised by your dentist to get a toothbrush every three months so that's quite a difficult issue to tackle but when it comes to sort of towels so you can buy towels that are plastic free organic cotton towels um you can buy all kinds of houseware type type items that are that are more expensive but they will last you so much longer and it's I, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to think the same. Whenever it comes to giving away a bulk of money at one, all in one go, it's really quite depressing. But when you can sort of, ca- when you can change someone's attitude to understand that it means that they'll be saving this money in the long run, then, then you might be able to um, get them looking at alternatives. But there are alternatives out there that will, that are more of an investment. I mean, how many times do you have to throw, throw what we would class long-term items away? because they don't last, because they're cheap and because they're made of flimsy plastic. Or even just something like, I was absolutely mind blown the other day because I found out that you can get reusable like cotton pads for your makeup. So obviously if you wear makeup, you've used cotton pads before which you just throw away, but you can get ones that you wash and reuse and I was absolutely mind blown. So you've kind of answered my last question in which how we can make a difference. In a summary, basically, it's just by looking around you and seeing what alternatives you can get your hands on. So thank you so much for joining me um, for my final interview about uh, climate change and conservation. Um, thank you so much, Chrissy, And um, I look forward to seeing how you get on with your zero waste journey. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm never short of words when it comes to climate change, plastic pollution. So. So that's it for this episode of Inside the Petri Dish. I've learnt a lot from Chrissy. I will continue to work on ridding my life of unnecessary plastic. Next time, I take my findings and report back to Vicky and Tay, and we'll talk about what we've learnt. So until next time, see you later.